Well, we are about to start our panel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to thank you again for joining us at this very uh, important uh, panel. Every panel uh, that we had during these two days has been extremely interesting and extremely important. And now we're coming to uh, a panel that we host traditionally at our Posidonia event uh, with uh, industry uh, captains, industry titans, um, major owners who are active across uh, many sectors of uh, shipping and who are going to um, share with us their insight across the industry segments and uh, on the direction and future of the industry. I would like to um, thank uh, Keith Bilotti, partner at Sweden Kissel, for uh, moderating it. Uh, Keith and I are in New York. Uh, the, uh, the other participants are in Athens. And frankly, I, I don't think we could have uh, a better panel. Uh, I would like to welcome Angeliki Frangu, uh, Nikos Tsakos, Petros Papas, uh, George Prokopiu, and Vangelis Marinakis is joining us in a minute. So thank you very much. Uh, Keith, uh, please take over, and uh, I look forward to a great, great panel. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you here um, today. Uh, this panel is obviously comprised of the biggest names. Uh -huh. and we're going to take out our crystal ball today, and we're going to tackle the future of shipping, business, investment opportunities, and all the shipping segments. Angelique, I'd like to start with you. You know, we're speaking together at a very interesting time in our history. We're currently experiencing a technological boom. We're embarking on a decarbonization revolution. And all of this is set in the backdrop of a pandemic that has forced billions of people to shelter in place. With all this going on, I think it'd be really helpful if you could start us off and give us a broad overview of the shipping markets and where we stand today. Uh, th thank you, Keith, and uh, good morning to everyone in New York. I think basically we are, you know, this pandemic has caused uh, and is continue to go uh, to uh, uh, to cause a significant disruption in society. Basically, and uh, I, I, we like to call it a pandemic economy. What is happening? The guarantees and self isolation has created. Uh, um, it has changed the nature of logistics. Some are very obvious of the effects we saw. I mean, uh, when in the middle of the guarantees we saw uh, basically uh, no transportation, we saw oil prices collapsing to negative territory, uh, uh, creating a huge opportunity for the tanker uh, uh, market with rates uh, of VLCCs over uh, $200,000. Some less obvious, like what is happening on the containers. I mean, where uh, all of a sudden, uh, weight wipes, uh, uh, pers protective equipment, uh, uh, cleaning stuff, and the urgency of this uh, stuff to, to be transported, and the disruption in the logistics has created a very booming container market. So basically, this is a pandemic economy where we have uh, the effects of uh, the huge stimulus on an unprecedented uh, level. I mean, we have seen developed uh, countries, developing countries getting this huge stimulus. And we are basically having a, to navigate on an environment where uh, every prediction was wrong. You had uh, analysts, uh, shipping analysts, uh, all the major shipping analysts, but even IMF predicting, totally uh, not being able to predict the market. You had uh, basically, uh, everyone was uh, in the beginning underestimating the effects of the pandemic and today, and in the second half, overestimating the disruption. And we have seen that basically uh, countries that have uh, used their stimulus have produced very nice uh, results, like China has addressed effectively the pandemic and we have seen growth on, uh, G on GDP of almost 5% uh, in Q3. Overall, the country, the second economy in the world will be growing to about 2% year on year, very significant. But even United States uh, that address with a huge stimulus directly to the 
actual households in order to uh, save the, uh, you know, to, to, uh, uh, to, see the, to deal with an unemployment. We have seen that uh, has actually is uh, uh, coming much better. And what is this economy is showing is that basically uh, the estimates we had for the second half is much better. So 2% growth for China. Uh, uh, U.S. is instead of contracted by 8% will be minus 4%. And Europe and all uh, basically all the major economies. But what it has shown this pandemic uh, economy is that you have some losers and some winners in industries. Uh, travel, hotel, uh, restaurants, uh, this kind of an economy is, is uh, suffering. Uh, because basically, uh, the, 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 the products have to go to the consumer. So basically, transportation is a big beneficiary. Transportation of goods has been a beneficiary. And basically, shipping is part of that, uh, uh, of that uh, uh, service. We are, um, so transportation is the backbone of this pandemic economy. Inefficiency is net positive for shipping, and we have seen it how it is developing in every side, from dry and the need for uh, uh, grains and for uh, food security, for iron ore, for infrastructure, to the demand in, uh, in China for oil, for products, to the container segment where you really need, uh, you need today the, uh, the, the staff, short haul, long haul, and you don't mind if it's a protective equipment, if it's cleaning staff, to pay 10, 20 cents more. This is basically where we are in a new pandemic economy. Angeliki, thank you for that. That was an excellent summary. You know, we're going to need to unpack some of this as we continue our conversation today. You know, I think where we'll start is on the supply side. And, and George's question is for you. You know, given what's going on in the market and all the things that Angeliki was talking about, I think it'd be helpful for our audience if you address vessel supply and, and the, the main drivers of it right now. Uh, and, and perhaps you can give your perspective, uh, you know, specifically on the, the LNG and the, and the tanker markets. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for giving us uh, the, this opportunity to see each other and exchange views. These, the usual gatherings are not taking place anymore. And uh, it's true that we miss each other. I would like to, to say that, uh, as always, it's very difficult to predict the future. So I'm not uh, there to say a prediction if the market goes up or down. But I can say some facts, which, uh, as uh, very well Angeliki uh, described, uh, the tanker market had a good go by coincidence, where the Russians and the Saudis were competing on market share and they started producing as much as they could. And uh, helped by the pandemic, where the demand also was very low, the price of the commodity collapsed. So when something is very cheap, everybody is buying, storing it, for the future. And this is what happened. We have seen uh, the oil below $20 in real terms, not uh, on the stock market. So I do believe that the oil price is artificially high. And in general, the energy prices will go south. And uh, as it is easy to see the relationship between LNG and uh, crude oil. One barrel of, L of uh, crude oil contains five and a half MMBTUs in order to compare energy with energy. So delivered in Europe, uh, LNG is four dollars per MMBTU now that has gone up. So that means that the equivalent energy cost on LNG and crude oil, the price should be $22 the barrel. 
And uh, of course, the differential from 22 to 40 is a squeeze on supply by closing the tabs. And at the same time, lack of infrastructure in uh, distributing the natural gas LNG. If it had equivalent uh, distribution network, the price of uh, oil would go down to around 20, as I believe will do soon. So uh, regarding uh, uh, we as ship owners, what we do today and the supply demand uh, equation is if somebody wants to be sure about what ship to go and order, he cannot, he has no answer. What type of engine, what size, in which speed to be optimized, in which uh, 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 size, because the, the vague guidance that we have with the regulations is about by 250, having 50% 50 uh, green gas emissions of what we had at 2008. So that what means for me and my technical department, we go to, the, to Hyundai or to New Times and we say we want a ship, what ship? What, what this means? So we have lack of clear and transparent regulations and as they messed it up with the regulations with ballast water treatment, we are treating the water when billions of tons are going with the uh, Gulf Stream and all these per second moving all the earth around. We are with a drop that we have in our ballast tanks, we are treating it, uh, treating it and uh, uh, creating pollution, uh, unnecessary equipment. And the second mess up that they've done with regulations was with scrubbers. You want, of course, we have to comply. There were two alternatives. One was to use compliant fuel and one was to take high uh, contain sulfur and treat it on board. Of course, and very uh, good uh, speculation, welcome Vagelis. Uh, 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 very good uh, speculation was made by owners, others going on the scrubber way and others not going on the scrubber uh, way, but this was not because of the environment. This was because of speculation. As you speculate on the exchange rate between Swiss franc and dollar, they were speculating between the price of compliant and non-compliant fuel. And when somebody sees that the difference was 350 to 400 dollars, it is obvious that you say, let's invest, I'll make a killing in 12 months, I'll pay off my investment. Now, where the difference is 50 to 60 dollars, to 65 dollars, the economics are different. But all this is against and I, I believe, uh, I don't know if we will expand to the, your second uh, point about the environment, because we are giving the wrong signal in the world. And I want to make a statement that ship owners do care deeply about the environment and always they buy the best available. What is the latest? Nobody goes and says, give me your 10 years old model. Everybody goes and orders the best available wealth technology ship builders, engine builders have, can produce. So the IMO and the classification societies helped by the owners should target the right enemy. And the right enemy is pollution. It's not ship owners, it's not engine builders, it, and there are two big categories. One is the desirable and the other is the doable. So for the futurology, futurologists, it's very nice to talk about the future, but we have to talk about today. 
and tomorrow, to, tomorrow, tomorrow, actually tomorrow, when you go to place an order. So we have to reduce our ambitions for uh, zero emissions in uh, 10 years or 20 years and see what we can do from tomorrow. And this has two legs, existing ships and new ships. It's different what you do with existing ships and it's different what you do with new buildings when you go to order. So I don't want to monopolize. I have plenty to say for all these items, and, uh, depending on the available time and the patience of the, uh, the listeners, I can go on or stop. Thank you so much, George. Uh, Petros, you know, George talked a lot about all of the uncertainty that's out there. Uh, there's not consistent emission regulations. Uh, it's unclear about the propulsion. Um, it's obviously having an impact on the order book, um, specifically in the dry bulk sector. You know, we're seeing it at lows that we haven't seen for years. Um, can you give us some perspective on, on what you see on the supply side, you know, get, given these headwinds? You know, is, is this sufficient to keep people out of the market for a long time? And, and do you feel optimistic about this or, or do you feel like it's low and, and it's going to remain this way for a while? Thank you, Keith. Hello to everybody. Um, well, the good thing about um, the emissions issues is that exactly you do not know what vessel and with what engine to order, as, as uh, George said. So... Um, you can see that very few uh, new buildings are being ordered right now. Uh, they're only coming or mainly coming from uh, Chinese uh, leasing houses or from Japanese that want to support their, uh, their um, uh, shipyards. And we see a few examples like uh, Vagelis' uh, dual fuel engine, which uh, has LNG um, uh, option as well which in my view is a good solution for the medium term. It's not the final solution. But um, the fact of the matter is that there's very little, uh, very little ordering. And this is the main benefit of what's going to happen going forward for, uh, for shipping. Um, the pandemic also had some effect, especially because of the first uh, half of the year where everything looked uh, very gloomy. Um, and of course, people don't order un under such circumstances and, and cost of shipyards increase and therefore they cannot lower their prices very much. Um, presently on the dry side, order book is at six and a half percent, which I think is the lowest in the last 30 years. I don't see prospects of, of that uh, increasing much because we don't know what to order. And that might give us the opportunity going forward to, um, be, uh, to see better markets, make some money, because when the time comes and we will need new types of vessels, um, who is going to have the money to, uh, to order them? Uh, shipping has not been very profitable in the last 10 years. And... Um, I, I, I suspect that we will see a break coming, which is going to be the good part of the pandemic, of uh, the emissions control, etc. So I'm personally uh, optimistic for the future. And um, actually, I think that for existing players, the more regulation will actually uh, create barriers to entry for others. That's Thank my you, take. Thank you, Petros. Uh, Nikos, this question is for you. You know, the Greek fleet is among the youngest in the world. It's about 12 years old. Um, you know, how do you manage fleet expansion, renewals, uh, you know, in this environment of an uncertainty? How, how, do you, uh, how do you manage that, given all the uncertainty that's just been discussed? Uh, thank you and uh, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. And, uh, 
Uh, welcome, Vangelis. Uh, it was a very good night last night. Uh, my son and I enjoyed uh, very much uh, uh, the, whole, the whole evening. Uh, from what I've been uh, listening to uh, so, so far, uh, it is obvious that uh, all of us are literally on the same boat. Uh, what you have spoken about is uh, really, for the short or medium term, good news. Uh, since my days as Intertango chairman, I, was, uh, I had become a joke for telling everybody not to build new ships. Finally, thanks to uh, not only the pandemic, but to the changes of technology that Mr. Prokopiou spoke about and Petros, we are seeing very, very few ships being built today. I think this is uh, good news for all of us. I don't think anyone out here in Greece uh, thanks to all, all of us here in the, in the panel and many, many more around, Greece uh, has one of the youngest fleets in the world, which means that uh, none of us should be in any agony to try and uh, you know, build ships without uh, any purpose. So that will give us a cushion of time of a relatively, uh, I would say, comfortable market None of us are expecting to see the first six months of, uh, of 2020 in tankers very soon coming back. But that, this does not mean as demand starts creeping up and it's, it's starting back. I mean, you see the, uh, the jet fuel is coming back in, in a small way. So the clean market uh, will get some, uh, you know, some legs in the middle of the, in the winter helping uh, also with the, with, with the cold winter. Uh, a lot of uh, oil companies are out there bottom, bottom digging, which means that they are looking for uh, employment uh, at what they consider to be very, very low levels. And why would anybody pay $25,000 for one of our Suez Maxes if he could take it for 5000 today on, on the spot market? So I think these are good signs going forward. They do not solve the big issues that all of you have, uh, uh, have uh, brought up, but let's uh, not say we are not here uh, losing sleep on what vessels we are not being, are not being able uh, to build as uh, we go forward. Uh, George Prokopiou and, uh, you know, he spoke about things for two, two, 2050. I think the changes are coming, uh, are coming quicker. I think 2030 is what we are looking right now uh, to try and, and manage. Uh, technology in many cases is changing quicker than iPhone. I think I have changed le less of my phones than the technology, the engine technology, propulsion technology has changed uh, so far. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think these are things that are keeping people uh, looking very carefully. Uh, our policy is if one client comes over and he wants us to try with him a new technology for going long term, we will consider that it very seriously. But uh, at least in, in my case, I am not uh, planning to build ships uh, with, uh, before the ball uh, stabilizes somewhere. And, and I would like to also bring back the idea that uh, George Prokopiou and, and others had discussed uh, just, uh, just before the, the virus, and for some reason it has uh, faded away. What, what, uh, what ever happened to slow steaming? I think, uh, George, we, we, you, know, you were very, very, uh, I think, um, fanatic, uh, uh, you know, uh, fanatic uh, on, on promoting the slow steaming. For some reason, this has lost uh, some steam right now. That could be a solution from now until 2030. Thank I'll, you. I'll revert after uh, Mr. Marinakis makes his statement. Sure. Continuing along this demand theme that, uh, that Nico started, Vangeli, um, will you talk a little bit about, about the demand that we've seen? We've seen you know, extraordinary transformation over the past year. Um, in the oil markets, we touched upon uh, in all the various sectors. We've had this pandemic. You know, we're now seeing a lot of stimulus from governments. You know, can you talk a little bit about demand and can you talk about, you know, your views on, on it and whether we're just really restocking right now or if we're going to see continued growth as we, as we come out of this? 
First of all, I would like to comment uh, in uh, what uh, George uh, Prokopiu uh, mentioned earlier about um, the environmental and uh, all these issues. I think that uh, what we face is uh, that uh, we are navigating into waters uh, as far as uh, uh, pollution environment is concerned without a proper guidance or regulation in what we need to do for the future and at the end of the day with no support or very minimal support from oil majors or even liner companies for the containers uh, and uh, charters in general. And also, for example, uh, to be more specific, you are uh, trying to uh, build uh, some new ships uh, for uh, the tanker industry or for the com container industry. And you refer to the yard about the energy efficiency design index. And the yard is coming back or the classification can come back or uh, any other consultants that you choose to cooperate with. And you see that the whole thing is so not only uncertain, you know, there is no real guidance what to go for. Uh, then the question is for how long, but at the end of the day, the charters, the oil majors, or even the liner companies, they don't give you any guidance or any support on, the, on what uh, they are willing to pay you or uh, what they really want as far as uh, uh, pollution and uh, uh, to reduce emissions. All this is, I, th I think, very vague. And at the end of the day, uh, you cannot uh, make up your mind with a proper guidance in uh, what the next step is. And uh, what to, we have seen uh, lately is that there was a lot of discussions, uh, a lot of LOIs signed, uh, also some contracts for the dual fuel, you know, for uh, uh, scrubbers before. And now uh, for the new buildings that we are uh, negotiating, and of course other owners are negotiating with the yards, we go back to conventional engines and uh, uh, no discussion again uh, for uh, dual fuel uh, or we can have it as an option, but in reality, we go back on what uh, we were doing two, three years ago. The only difference is that uh, uh, there is some improvement, slight improvement in the consumptions of these engines. So in reality, uh, it's all very well said to talk about uh, all these emissions and the environment, but little progress has been done from everybody in the industry. And it's up to us, uh, to the owners, at the end of the day, to pay the price uh, without getting any compensation from anybody in the industry. So this is something that I think that uh, we should uh, be aware and we should be concerned. And maybe at the end of the day, uh, we need to cooperate <laughs> closer in order for us to take some decisions uh, as a body from the tango, from uh, a cooperation that we can uh, all discuss on the bigger companies, let's say, that we, uh, uh, let's say, dictate our way forward. Because right now, as I said, it's very confusing and we're not getting anywhere uh, properly as far as what to do or how to get uh, uh, a proper ordering for the years to come. That's what I think 
about all this, and uh, of course, I would like to hear your comments on it. Like uh, <clears throat> very well said, uh, Vagelis. If you uh, if you allow me to take it from where Mr. Uh, uh, Marinakis has uh, arrived, uh, we know that we need energy to move a ship from A to B. I, I leave the uh, statements that the, the shipping is uh, the less polluting uh, means of transportation, 93 is the most efficient, 93% of the world trade is on ships and so on. I leave this because we, we are repeating ourselves. The, the energy that the, the ship needs is coming from the time being from fossil fuels. And there are some fossil fuels that are creating more and some that are creating less pollution. And the amount of pollution that you create is direct analogy to the amount of fuel that you burn. The speed versus the uh, consumption is not proportionate, is in the tube. So it increases uh, dramatically on the, th on the third instead of going proportionally. If we have a commodity like uh, iron ore or crude oil on board, and we go with a speed of 15 knots, we need 30 days to arrive at port. If we had a, a vessel that was going uh, instead of 15 knots, 10 knots, we will need, instead of 30 days, 45 days. The cost, what is the differential of cost? Is the interest that the cargo is, the cargo owner is bearing, because if a VLTC has $80 million a worth of cargo, and you do your calculation, per month delay is $100,000. But I come first to the question, and then I give you the answer. Why we need the fuel, uh, crude oil, or fuel oil, or iron ore, or all other bulk commodities to go on ships that they have been designed to be optimized at a speed of 15 knots. This is 15, 15 and a half. The propeller, the auxiliaries, the engine, the horsepower, the lines of the ship, the size is optimized for such speed. And at the same time, we have a more uh, 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 obvious example is with the container ships where they go 23 knots, and when they go 23 knots, they, get, they burn 220 tons per day, a, a large one. And instead, if the same ship goes at eight knots, uh, the, uh, which is one third, you need three times more ships, the three ships are burning less than half of one the one ship is burning. This is mathematics, you can do it with the horsepower and so But the lack of direction is because there is no specific rule. And what is the specific rule? Is the permission greenhouse gas emissions per ton mile of cargo transported per category of ship, per ship type. So much for the VLTC, so much for the Israel, the APRA, the Cape, the Panamax, the Kamsarmax. So the maker has, and the engine builder and the maker has to optimize a vessel that lies within these permissible uh, limits. And this is nothing new. It's the same thing as the uh, car industry did. They said, 10 liters per 100 kilometers, then they went to eight, to seven, to six, and with the innovation of the technology, the car industry became more efficient and the cars became less pollutant because the pollution that we create is directly analogy to the amount of fuel that we use. The properties of the fuel 
because it's different if we're using uh, ammonia. But this, for the for the LNG to have a distribution system, and still today there is no a distribution system because what I call a distribution system is not to have one supplier in every port have at least two suppliers in every port because if you have one supplier in one port he'll ask whatever he likes to give you uh, uh, the, the fuel so it took 50 years so now we are talking about ammonia about hydrogen and so on and all this after 50 years maybe they will be around if this proved uh, doable but for tomorrow for the new shift is this type of regulation that I propose, where we'll have ships that will be optimized at eight uh, miles, uh, at eight knot speed, different sizes, maybe it will be double because you'll need much lesser engines, smaller engines. The hull lines, the propellers, the auxiliary will be optimized for this speed. And also, this is for the new ship. For the existing ships, it is the obvious. Tomorrow, 10 knots, all the ship, immediately, we don't reduce. Now we have an obsession with the soxes. You reduce soxes, noxes, CO2, uh, uh, particulate from tomorrow and is measurable. You can police it because of uh, the uh, automatic identification systems and so on. Immediately you can know if somebody is cheating and for the uh, uh, goods that they, they need to be transported fast to have exception because if this is a, a refer ship or has, has a perishable uh, cargo that has to go but from tomorrow we can reduce the emission more than 50 percent not wait to 230 and 250 from tomorrow and i wonder who is against that shipyards because they'll need to build uh, more ships that, that, to build ship owners that they'll make money from tomorrow environmentalists it was the first time that within seven days more than four thousand ships ship owners of four thousand ships signed their agreement for the slow steaming for this proposition it is two years ago and imo uh, wrote this in their own suit as we say and they made this uh, regulations about uh, 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 scrubbers, which after uh, two months they were banned from half the, the the ports, and people invested 500 million, 300 million, 600 million dollars, creating pollution, going directly to the sea, and why? Because wrong assessment from IMO. So I'm very much bitter about what is happening with IMO. And it is the second time that they are messing up. The first time was with ballast water treatment. Millions, billions of tons per second. They are traveling all over the world. We are getting a dactylitra, how do you call it in English? And we have to spend tons of uh, fuel for, for more energy, installing uh, unnecessary equipment, creating huge pollution for all this equipment. So we, it was the first time that five environmental uh, organizations, big ones like WWF, uh, uh, Greenpeace and so on, co-signed the petition towards the IMO together with the ship owners. It's the first ever. And this is thanks to my daughter, Ioana, who had the courage to go and beg outside Greece, because Greeks were a little bit cautious which side to take. It's not about size, it's about the reality. We you want are... to protect the environment or not. If we want to protect the environment, we have to take steps from tomorrow. If we are to, 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 to look in a different way and uh, ignoring, we can continue doing that. Um, are... if, I, if I may, I think, George, George, I think this is a very, very, I mean, it sounds as we have said, and you know, we have been, as Intertango, a very big promoter of this because it ticks all the current boxes. And, uh, you know, it's, it's impossible. Perhaps it sounds too good to be true. And perhaps the only way slow steaming can, be, uh, can move forward and be imposed is if somebody else, other than the ship owners, promotes it. As you know, the ship owners, for good or bad reasons around the world, 
we do we are not seen by the public as uh, I, I would say very likable characters for uh, for reasons that are very hard to explain so if you get organizations outside of the maritime uh, uh, broad maritime to support this i think we might uh, have uh, some more success but also it is up to us today regardless of the regulations we and I'm talking mainly for the tanker owners, and I think all of us uh, there uh, are tanker owners uh, in one or the other way. We are uh, cruising at 14 and 15 knots to try and get cargos at negative operating rate expenses today. So instead of us theoretically trying to convince the world about how good slow steaming is, let's right now move at $8,000 to go get a negative return uh, from the ships and you see how our spot markets will have also a good effect for that and for the environment. This is something we could decide to do today if, if we would like. You are Thank absolutely you. right, uh, but it is a matter that the charter party also includes this and they don't, you don't get a claim for slow steaming. There is no doubt. Charter parties have to be negotiated anyway. Nick and George, uh, there is no doubt that uh, slow steaming is the cleaner, the most straightforward uh, way for everybody in the industry. Also, something that can be monitored and uh, is the cleanest uh, way forward. And uh, also uh, creates opportunity for nearly everybody involved. Uh, but uh, there seems some uh, uh, reluctance. But on the other hand, uh, in the IMO, the, uh, the ones that they take the decisions, I think that, uh, and of course this is a very big discussion, but uh, I think that the mistake that we all do is that uh, someone else who has not a real interest besides for us. So it's our fault that we allow it. Even knowledge, I would add. Mm -hmm. Interest and knowledge. Okay. But the interest is very important. Most important. And of course, knowledge goes without saying that they need to have. But at the end of the day, who decides for us? We are risking uh, millions or billions of dollars every day. And what we are proposing is something that you don't need to be a scientist, you don't need to be uh, uh, extremely clever or brilliant mind. It's very straightforward, very simple, and it needs to be introduced as soon as possible. And, and so far, uh, we haven't uh, gone anywhere with it. Because this is also something that, as far as the tango is concerned, we need to put extreme pressure there. I, I agree. But I say when the speed limits were imposed in the US and all over the world, it was not by the car industry uh, that it was imposed. It was imposed by authorities that were considered neutral. So I think, you know, instead of us talking to each other, I think all of us in this panel and, and many more of our colleagues agree. But we have to convince authorities that are not uh, looked with uh, skepticism as supporters are, are, are viewed. But there is a big, you know, the difference is for the governments, that's not uh, only applies for our uh, government or for our country, for all the countries in the world, for one reason or the other, they regard shipping as an offshore business or is not, they don't take it serious or uh, the appropriate ministers that they are dealing with it, us in the car industry, even in the airline industry, you know, the shipping business, it's something that is not considered part of, the, of its country. That's why, you know, they don't decide for it. The oh. owner's votes are 1,000. The public promising the impossible are millions. So the politicians are promising the impossible. So we have to divide the desirable from the doable. Once yeah, this is understood, then we'll have the solution. Yes, but the business chain around shipping, uh, George, 
that the people are, that they are involved, they are millions. The living standards will change if shipping is not prospering and if there are not available ships to do what we are doing, carrying and sometimes subsidizing the goods to go from A to B. But unfortunately, our uh, uh, power is very limited. You can subsidize one trip, a second trip, then you'll be bankrupt. So <laughs> this, this is what... So guys, let, let's shift gears a little bit here. You know, the environment is very important. It's on everyone's minds. You know, investors, banks are hyper-focused on the environment and access to capital, I think, is a natural segue uh, here as you guys are, are, are focused on, on emissions and, and people are only committing capital to those industries and companies that are focused on these decarbonization efforts. And so Petros, I'd like to hear your views on, you know, where is the money available in shipping? You know, what sort of access to capital do you guys have? You know, and where would you think about deploying in, in, in the context of the current environment? Thank you, Keith. But I'll take that in one minute, but I wanted to say something about the scrubbers. Uh, George, you keep on, re on referring to the scrubbers. There is a number of very serious studies that do not, con do not agree with your assessment that uh, they pollute the oceans. Perhaps you should read them and then we can have a, a talk between the two of us. Uh, a second thing I wanted to tell you about is that we're presently installing filters on our scrubbers that in effect will probably clean the oceans from microplastics and other, um, and other ingredients, harmful ingredients that already exist. So let's not dwell let's, on the scrubbers agree, anymore. Let's I agree mean, that we disagree. Let's agree that we disagree. Yeah, but I, I, I'm not let's, the one that brings up this issue all the time. Okay. We have all these, all these uh, China, uh, uh, Japan, uh, Germany, uh, UK, all these places that they banned the open loop. Uh, yes, uh, uh, like uh, oh, eight, ten percent, eight percent. George, sorry, you have talked for twenty-five minutes. Eight percent of the world ports may have banned because they do not know exactly what is going on, but it is technology and that will prove at the end that it is better than rather than worse in in my view at least um and you know very well and you know very well that i co-signed your uh, your Ioana's um slow Thank steaming you know. and, and it's something that i had talked about two years before that as well so it's going to happen anyway there's no question about that so, but let me turn to the... It's not to ship owners to become refineries, small refineries on board. If they don't like this type of fuel, the, the refineries should be banned to produce it. So it is the Greek verb uh, saying that they cannot hit the Gaidaros and they, and they, and they hit the Samari. Yeah, so, I, agree with, I agree with you. However, it was one of the IMO solutions, so we cannot really argue against it anymore. No, so let me talk about IMO because they are continuing to the wrong direction. If they don't put the, the grams, the permissible grams per ton mile of cargo transported per type of ship, we'll never end up. This is the only logic solution for the engine builders and ship builders to come with ships that they comply with these restrictions. Otherwise, George, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid much stricter regulation than that of IMO is coming. I'm afraid. But you, I you start are... talking about scrubbers today, it's like as relevant as a, as a Blackberry telephone. I think, you know, the world has moved uh, above I, that. I, I agree with that. I agree Hopefully with that. Blackberry might come back again, but I think, uh, <laughs> you know, let's, let's, uh, get, let's move forward. Yes, exactly. So I don't understand why it's being brought back again. Anyway, access to capital. Um, capital markets, they're mostly closed to new entries um, and definitely for, small, for smaller players. Um, for existing players, if you want to raise money, you have to do it at a discount to your NAV and that will not make your shareholders, your shareholders very happy as they will be diluted. Uh, bank debt, again, mainly for probably bigger, uh, bigger uh, companies 
with uh, consolidated balance sheets and uh, corporate structure. Um, there's also, of course, the green factor, uh, which will play a major role going forward in, uh, in bank lending. But again, this is going to be for organized outfits. The good thing about uh, Greek shipping companies is that the Greek banks have re-entered the sector and um, at relatively decent margins, they lend 50 to, uh, 50 to 60 percent levels. So the smaller medium companies do have an access through them. And of course, there are the, the financial boutiques that uh, will lend at higher percentages even, but uh, at very high cost, like seven and a half to 12 and a half percent, which is really very expensive. Um, there is also sale and lease back from China at about 60, 65 uh, percent. Uh, again, for better names um, with decent margins and uh, in Japan, uh, but much more selective at uh, even at 70 plus percent and uh, margins that start from the high twos. Um, as far as private equity is concerned, they have burned their fingers, their fingers in, uh, in shipping. Um, and I don't think they're anywhere to be found. There are still some, uh, some um, uh, private equity persevering, such as uh, Oak Tree, for example, uh, which are with us. And um, actually, I think for good reason, because I'm personally positive about the next two to five years, but I think that is going to be probably your last question and I don't want to dwell. So all in all, uh, most finance is for bigger and better organized companies um, and relatively amply uh, available at uh, decent margins. Uh, the smaller ones will have to look mostly at local banks and at historical relationship banks. And finally, bonds, uh, which I forgot to mention, um, I'm looking at, um, we're looking at uh, green bonds, and, uh, but they're very expensive. They're still uh, 8%, so actually I don't see the advantage of uh, a bond being green or, or whichever color. Um, baby bonds, etc. but they're expensive and uh, mostly the, the market is closed. So there is a short and quick summary for uh, um, capital availability, Keith. Thank you, Petros. The, um... We're going to see a lot of increased costs to comply with all these environmental demands. You know, smaller companies are, are going to be, uh, have much more challenges as they bear those costs. Vangeli, and, and, and I want Angeliki afterwards to address this, um, are we going to see more consolidations uh, in, in the market as a result of that? You know, we often hear about consolidation. Um, everyone speaks up the, about the advantages of, of scale and economies of scale and size. You know, but then there's consolidations and then folks don't necessarily realize all those benefits. Uh, Vangeli, I know you recently uh, were involved in some consolidation. Can you talk about your experience and, you know, how you found that? You know, I'm the last person to speak about uh, consolidation because my worst decision, business decision so far, was the merger we did with Diamond S. Uh, you know, it was... Uh, Looking back, uh, uh, a very bad decision because uh, uh, the management uh, involved and the CEO involved and the family of the CEO, uh, it's, uh, you know, the uh, most useless uh, uh, attitude and uh, results that uh, I have ever seen since uh, I was involved in actively in shipping in the last, let's say, 30 years. For example, uh, during uh, 2020, we enjoyed uh, a very strong uh, tanker market. And uh, uh, what happened at the end is that we didn't manage to fix one ship for period. We didn't manage to sell any ships. We didn't manage to renew uh, any single vessel of uh, the fleet. So consolidation, in theory, it's something that makes a lot of sense, provided uh, you have the right people and also the people that uh, they have real interest in it, not only a very good uh, wage and compensation package uh, for them and uh, 
the rest of the family because uh, in this way it doesn't work. Uh, so, as I said, uh, uh, you need, uh, in order a consolidation to work, uh, all the parties concerned should have interest in order to uh, bring expenses uh, down, in order to uh, take better commercial uh, decisions because of the bigger presence and the relations that uh, are developed with all the chapters in the market. Of course, that goes to the uh, suppliers and uh, also to, uh, in order to minimize your expenses because you provide a bigger volume, you can negotiate better contracts. But once again, you need people that have interest. If you rely on uh, guys that uh, uh, the interest is not there for them, then consolidation would work uh, much worse than uh, to have a smaller company that uh, you control and uh, the procedures are clearer and more, and more effective. Thank you, Bengali. Angeliki, um, there's been a number of consolidations in the liner space, but it seems like the, the, the liner space, they're focusing more on vertical integration moving more into logistics, you know, can, can you give some perspective on this and, and your view of consolidations? I will, uh, you know, consolidation, I will say that in Sydney we have seen some uh, uh, happening already, but I think it has run its course, I will, as uh, like Gail uh, have said, we have seen some uh, large entity that has, has been created. What I like to touch upon, and I think is a, a, an important issue that we have to be uh, is important for our industry and uh, and is is about the uh, efficiency and and uh, climate uh, i mean whatever we're going to say the pandemic has created uh, has brought the climate risk in the forefront of everyone uh, i mean as an industry um, sometimes we don't articulate we or we have not been very pro you know we don't articulate well some things or we don't we are not proactive on regulation so we ended up on, uh, I don't want to go into the scrubber, uh, slow steaming, is basically analog, analog solutions on a digital problem. And the reality is that we are not a subsidized industry. So basically we will have to see another industry to get advantages. Shipping is long haul. And uh, basically you can see that in the cars, the internal combustion engine and the EV uh, car is in the next five years will be at par at cost. So that is already a, a, a level that we have seen. In shipping, we'll have certain interim steps until we need to see what is the uh, long haul uh, design of uh, propulsion. Um, you know, this is gonna be a major shift and it's gonna be hydro, it's gonna be LNG. LNG has 30% less carbon footprint. So this is, and we will have to see another industry because of course we are not gonna be subsidized. This is about, uh, you know, a car industry, which is uh, consumers are subsidized, uh, um, the uh, planes and the, you saw what Airbus had announced, the hydro engine. This is where we will see really the, the, the direction of our industry. So what we have to be, I think as an industry and as participants is to be very alert, very aware, because they're, they're gonna be in the steps and then there is gonna be a different way in order to reach the high standard of 70% uh, uh, to the in 2040, which is quite significant. So this is a basic, uh, uh, it has to be in our forefront and it has the, bas the basic benefits of being a barrier to entry. This technological uncertainty provides the real barrier to entry for, I mean, barrier to entry and and, and not really see building, a lot of sea building activity. Thank you for that. You know, with all the, the environments, obviously what we're focused on here. Let, and that's one phrase to, to what, to what uh, Angeliki said. Airbus and Boeing are the makers. They are not the pilots. We are the taxi drivers. We are the lorry drivers. So the pressure should be 
from the engine builders and in the shipyards to come up to comply with stringent, very stringent regulation. They, and they produce ships that the uh, public and environmentalists and everybody is happy with. The moment that they have a ready solution, we promise they will order the latest model. So the pressure it should not be on the ship owners. The pressure should be on the engine builders. Shipyards. We can help. We can promise to, to, to sign contracts when they have the product, but we are not producing, we are using them, we are running them. This is the big mix. Mr. Prokopio, one thing I want to mention. What I'm trying to say is that short haul, I mean, if you are talking cars, is battery. It's clear cut. I mean, it, ha it will be a reality and everyone sees it. I mean, even uh, we were together in a panel a year ago and it was not even apparent to people. The battery cost was, uh, uh, the, the battery uh, dropped in price in 10 years, 90%, and in the next five years will drop by another 5%. And you have parity between EV and actual, uh, uh, the cars within the next five years. So this is a reality for us. This was a dispute a couple of, uh, you know, years ago. The next thing is gonna be, uh, what we will see is that on, on long haul, which is shipping, like us, we will have to have engines that will be able to carry the kinds of cargoes we are talking. There, we, the conversation, we, we will have to see in other industries that are far more subsidized than us, like the planes, uh, uh, Airbus will have create an engine that will have to transport a lot of people and cargoes. So basically, that's where we will get the know-how and what it's going to be. It's going to be hydro, it's going to be LNG, LNG, doesn't seem to be the zero food, you know, it seems that something else have to be the solution. Between then, that time and the next time, we will need to have a lot of step-by-step -step approach where we'll have interim milestones. And this is where it is important as an industry, not to look on analog solutions, but to be very proactive because we actually benefit from that. Well, everyone, we're, we're running out of time here. This has been, obviously, this isn't going to get solved today. It's been a very spirited conversation and uh, one that's been very entertaining and informative for me. I hope the audience has found it uh, the same as well. I want to thank everybody on the panel today for sharing their views. Uh, it was very enlightening and uh, uh, you all did a wonderful job. So thank you. If maybe before we, before we leave, we can have each person give a closing statement, a brief one. I have to say, I'm absolutely pained to end this panel because it's been so dynamite. Uh, so if you don't mind, Keith, uh, let's have uh, each one give us a brief closing statement and then we will uh, adjourn for this panel. Wonderful. So maybe we can start with, uh, you decide. Uh, Angeliki, uh, let, let's continue with you. If you could give your closing statement and uh, that would be helpful. A brief statement, please. You know, the, what I will say is that it can be also your crystal ball. We are in a very unique situation where we have a pandemic economy, uh, which it has the benefit of having as a driver the transportation and shipping being a beneficiary. And together you have a technological uh, unknowns. So these two very adverse situations may be beneficial for shipping. This is a, uh, what I will say that is as we're going to 2021, this is what I find unique uh, in our market. Two very adverse situations can be very beneficial overall. Petros? My view is that we have to embrace environmental regulation and uh, we have to be there as Greeks and participate in the organizations so that we have a say, because if we're not there and we're negative, we will be banned from any decisions going forward. I think that in the future, this is going to benefit us. We will have lower ordering, we will have slow steaming, whether we want it or not. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, increased regulation will actually lessen competition and, uh, uh, and uh, will lessen supply. And that may mean more profits going forward, which we will then use to, to order those vessels that are zero emission and do not exist today. Vangeli? I think that uh, in today's world, uh, what I would like to wish is uh, for everyone to be 
safe and healthy, first of all. I think this is the most important thing nowadays. And for all of us to continue doing what we enjoy most, which is shipping, and uh, not to change a lot of things because we have been successful in what we are doing so far. We know uh, what to do, especially during rough seas that we were used to it over the years. And, you know, for me, the most important thing today is our health, to be safe and to do what we enjoy most in shipping. George? First of all, I want to say a big thank you to you and to all the participants and congratulations for all these various views. Uh, I want to make a statement that we, uh, on behalf of all ship owners, I have to make a statement that we respect, we protect, and we enjoy the environment and especially the seas. We are here in this business because of hobby and love of the sea mostly. And I have to pass a message to IMO. Issue the soonest possible the permissible greenhouse and gases uh, per ton mile of cargo transported per type of vessel. This will give the target. It is up to them to come with a clear cut solution. And then the engine builders and the shipyards will optimize and come with the best possible ship. Thank you so much. Thank you, George. And Nikos? Well, uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, yourself and Nick and his team for uh, keeping us uh, communicating, at least uh, e even in this uh, modern communication virtual world, because uh, if we do not communicate between us, uh, misunderstandings uh, happen, which uh, are not, it's not very nice to have misunderstandings between us. Uh, I would like to give a suggestion to Nikos that uh, all of us in this, uh, in this panel, uh, from what it seems, uh, we share exactly the same values and the same ideas and the same game plan. Uh, it will be good, Nikos, uh, but, but uh, as Vageli said before, and I think uh, George, we cannot influence situations. It would be very interesting when you bring all of us here to, you know, that we, we share all of the same things, it would be good to also have in these panels uh, you know, the people either from the IMO or from the European Union, people to whom they will understand <laughs> that shipping is not that very strange entity that is uh, polluting the world. And, and we are, uh, you know, people there to, to discuss. So please have open up your panels. I mean, we are talking between ourselves. So we've been doing it for years and years. And still, unfortunately, some of us cannot communicate correctly. But uh, uh, open it up because I think very, it, it's very important. Uh, again, stay safe and let's do not forget our seafarers, most of them being stranded on ships as we speak today and uh, going through very, very difficult circumstances for their health, mental and physical. And with that, I would like uh, to thank you, Nick, for, uh, for keeping us around. Nico, thank you. Thank you to all of you, first of all, for an amazing panel. And thank you for your suggestion, Nico. This event uh, that we're doing today is within the Posidonia Web Forms Week. So the idea was to pay tribute to Greek shipping, and that's why we restricted participation only to Greek principles, uh, major Greek principles. But now I know I have my marching orders publicly delivered. So now we know what the next webinar will be. Uh, and I count on having you on board. And of course, we're going to get together the IMO and the other organizations for a very healthy and constructive debate. So thank you for giving me my next, uh, next project. And thank you all for uh, joining us today. It has been an amazing panel. And uh, now we're rushing to the next one. I couldn't thank, thank you more. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nico. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.